So the talks tonight is five people tonight. So we've got Kerry, we've got Alex, uh, Tobin, Nick, uh, and Becky. So so um, each of these people, I've met them at least three or four times each, and they are really pushing the boundaries, the change of their job, the change of the way they work, the change of the way they think about project delivery. These are all pathfinders, and I'm really pleased to be associated with all of them. So I think we've got a little video now from Becky, and she's going to walk through her experience and the impact of project data analytics on her role. So if I could pass over to uh, uh, Becky. Hi, I'm Becky and I'm currently working as an account manager at Mel Metro Media and I'm also doing a project data analytics apprenticeship with Projecting Success. So during my time at Mel Metro Media, I found that my role has started to develop into one where I'm consistently looking into data whether it's for analysing performance based on different metrics to target just the best performing audiences for our campaign, to creating audience profiles for campaign analysis, or pulling together insights to support proactive and reactive sales pitches. It led me to research further into the capabilities of data in my spare time and enhance my knowledge of the subject. So during this time, data has become a passion for me and the main area in which I'd like to push my career going forward. Since the beginning of the apprenticeship, I've realised that there are a lot of changes that I can make in my role to automate, report and present data in ways that will allow me to use my time more efficiently, whilst also producing more visually appealing outputs. So it's made me realise that I'd like to move into a different department of the business that I'm currently in, and it's armed me with the tools that will help me to make that possible. Being a part of the apprenticeship has helped me to realise that I have a strong domain knowledge of the media industry and how we use data within our company. I never really saw myself as a data person and throughout the different assignments I've realised that I know a lot more than I thought I did. So learning to use different visual tools such as Power BI has also made me realise that there is a lot more that we can do to modernise reporting within our business. So the training so far by the tutors is exactly what I've been looking for in a course. No question is a stupid question. They're happy to go as in-depth as we need to make sure that as a group we all understand what we need to to move out of the session. The curriculum is super varied and it allows us to drive down into the most important parts that are going to be more relevant for our job roles. So it works well for any of us. Uh, data analytics, it goes hand in hand with the project profession. So by using our past experiences to help us think to the future and make predictions based on those, we can look at the best ways to improve our practices and become more efficient within our businesses. So if you're thinking of pursuing a data analytics apprenticeship, my best advice would be just go for it. So apprenticeships are a great way to learn more about the subjects that you're passionate about. They're great to develop your career and discover new exciting things about the business and the industry that you work for. And it's all within a comfortable environment that you already know so well. The data landscape and it's important across many industries is forever evolving. So I believe that in the future, data will be a big part of many different roles. And as data becomes more and more important, having the best knowledge of the subject is an absolute must. An apprenticeship like this is a is key and a great way to future proof in your career. That's brilliant. So a big thanks to Becky. Um, so I think in terms of the apprenticeship, right, what we need to pull out of this is what's the impact on people's jobs as well. I think you'll see that Becky is looking at um, her current job and looking at where she's moving next and what this does, it's going to open doors, it's going to build that portfolio of experience. And that's what the hacks do, is it enables you to build a story. This is all about your stories. So what we're trying to do is enable you to move up the ladder. And I've got a vision that one day, a project data analyst is going to be the most important person on the project who's worth a fortune. So if you can predict the future, you can see where the cost overruns are going to be. You can predict, you know, so you're right most of the time. You are going to be worth your weight in gold. And what a phenomenal job that is. So if I could pass over now to Alex Coles. So Alex has done a great job of working in CIS, right? Really, really impressed with what Alex is doing. He's changing the business, right? So with Alex and Danny and various other people, they are changing the way they work. This is not a tweet. This is not just and knocking up an app or something like that is changing the way they think. So, over Perfect. to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Martin. Hopefully, I can just share screen. Oh, that's the wrong side. You should Wait be able to see it. Yeah. Second, clicked on the wrong one. Excellent. Can you see five little icons? Yeah, cool. 
I'm not going to give you death by PowerPoint, but thought I'd just throw a few bits up just so you didn't at least get a big picture of my face on the screen. So I've been asked to give a little bit of a talk around my experiences with the apprenticeship. I'm just coming towards the end of it and hopefully to encourage a few people who'd consider going down a similar route. So I entered CISC um, or the industry with a civil engineering degree and initially worked as a designer before moving into CISC onto their graduate scheme. My original plan was to work up up the ladder through the uh, the construction and civils divisions, through what would be seen as kind of the standard route, contracts manager, project director, all that kind of thing. But as I was working at site level as an engineer, I began to understand some of the inefficiencies and frustrations that I'm sure many of the people on the call will know from the construction industry. And I realized that it's hard to make the kind of systemic changes you'd want to make when you're stuck at site level. So with that in mind, and, and before I'd actually come across projecting success, I'd look to move to a role within our strategy and performance department with a brief which was to understand what we were doing and to work out how we could do it better. Unfortunately, this was often hampered by a lack of hard data, and we really kind of struggled to show the, the, the kind of cause and effect of what we were trying to achieve. And this is where I um, got pointed towards the apprenticeship, and this is what kind of turbocharged my career, I'd say, because it gave me the tools to drive the improvements that I was wanting to make. It's given me that, that something different that I needed to make the changes and to understand what's possible, even if it's for things that I didn't have the skills around myself, like coding, for example, to at the very, to gain some kind of rudimentary skills, but really to understand what can be done by people far more skilled than myself. And what it's allowed is for me to become a bit of a translator between our data team and the wider business, which ensures that the people that we're working with are kind of making the biggest possible benefit with the work they're doing around data. So at the moment, where, where CISC are in terms of our kind of um, our path, my role is to generally get the right information to the right people. But it's also important to understand what's to come in terms of more advanced tools and the industry is moving so quickly. Projecting success and the apprenticeship has given me kind of a an understanding of where these changes are going to come from. I've been able to define a kind of constantly changing role within CISC, which covers pretty much every department of the whole business, touching everything from occupational health to planning and project controls to commercial to finance to marketing. Pretty much anything is on the table in the role, which is really exciting. It's also empowered me to look into areas that the company hadn't really considered, such as a load of work that I've recently done both within CISC and with projecting success around design data. And what's also quite exciting is that it's allowed me to empower new people within the company. So we've got lots of CIS graduates who have come in from university with a whole new set of skills that I wouldn't have had when I graduated five years ago particularly around things like coding. And we've now got graduates in the business who are redefining things on our project. And I've been able to kind of point them in the right direction and maybe amplify some of the work that they're doing. We've also been able to bring in some people into the business who don't have construction backgrounds, which has given us more of a diversity of skills. It's worth saying that I haven't given up being an engineer. Um, I've managed to become chartered at the same time as this, but fundamentally, I kind of believe that this is what at least some engineers look like now. And in terms of the broader benefits, from a personal perspective, it's given me a whole new set of skills I didn't expect to have. I kind of figured that when I graduated with a master's in civil engineering, that would be it for a while. But within five years, I'd kind of gone back to school and started to learn a whole new set of skills. And it's been really transformational. I was really lucky last year to get shortlisted for the Construction News Rising Star Award. Uh, and in my mind, it was all down to the skills that I'd learned through the apprenticeship. I don't think I would have been anywhere near that shortlist had it not been for the work I'd done. Um, it's allowed me to see a world beyond CISC. I know that when you're on site, you don't really see the world beyond the hoarding. Even at the centre of the business, you don't really see the world beyond the company. Um, through the apprenticeship, I've been able to speak to people in other companies and to understand kind of the industry perspective. And off the back of that to build a network of companies going through similar issues um, such as sitting across the table with people who would normally be competitors at a hack to work on a shared solution to a problem that we're both facing which is kind of makes the industry more exciting because it allows us to compete on what we're best at rather than how well we mitigate what we're bad at i'd say that honestly it feels like 
this community is is placed to make a real positive difference and that's kind of why i became an engineer in the first place so hopefully that's been interesting um any questions off the back of that i'm sure there's a q a at the end of this but um also find me on linkedin if you've got anything you want to ask me about the apprenticeship or hacks or or the data journey thank you very much absolutely, absolutely superb no oh, thank you much alex and and he's a bit modest as well right so in terms of the last challenge um so project hack 13 he came along and he brought a great challenge around design data and with that design data it's doing stuff that has never ever been done before all right, so all these problems with designs, all these sort of to and fro with RFIs, there's loads of money being burnt up, which is just waste, all right? Loads and loads of waste that's never been surfaced before. Down to Alex's efforts, he's breaking brand new ground, all right? He can transform the industry with some of the work he's doing, all right? So Alex, who's five years away from graduating, um, you know, is moving the dial. Really, really impressive stuff. So a big round of applause. Thank you, Alex. Right, if I can welcome uh, Kai to the stage. So Kai, over to you. Kai's from Highways England, or National Highways now, sorry. So Kai, if I could pass over to you. Very grateful, thank you. I can't hear Kai. Uh, still can't hear you. Now I think there's some. Is it your settings, Kai? Maybe. Is that any better? That's it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll ditch the uh, the headset. It's not very good anyway. So thank you very much. Let me just share the screen. A couple of slides to share. Cool. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Kai Tyler. I work for National Highways within the Complex Infrastructure Program. Um, I thought I'd just give a bit of background to myself to get started. Um, so I graduated from university in 2017. I actually studied psychology, so nothing to do with construction at all. Um, once I finished my degree, I completed a short internship um, to get a little bit of experience. And then I eventually joined National Highways in 2018 as project support. Now, this was a really big jump for me. Um, I had very little experience and kind of just dive straight into a massive project. So 1.5 billion pound project, which was the A14 improvement scheme. Now, the job was very admin heavy um, and I just simply accepted ways of working that have been used for a long time because I didn't know any better. Um, but, but now, thanks to the apprenticeship, my role has kind of changed and moved away from this admin heavy work to more of information management, um, specifically looking at how we can use the data, which a lot of it we already have, to work smarter um, and improve our project delivery. Now, I think out of the apprenticeship, what I've kind of discovered has been the most valuable lesson to me um, is just simply knowing what is possible. Um, the reason for this is because it really gives you the confidence and empowers you to think outside of the box and challenge processes that have already been in place for a very long time. So I'll give this example uh, very quickly. Um, as part of my role, I used to produce a lot of large reports on a monthly basis. Now, some of these are really big, about 70 plus pages, of near enough fully text and a couple of diagrams here and there. Now, my work has kind of shifted from producing these to thinking about how we can work a bit smarter and integrate Power BI into our monthly reporting to reduce the reliance on these reports um, and aid kind of data driven decisions instead. Now, this is done through using Power BI, so taking a lot of that word based data and visualizing it in Power BI so we can drill down and explore it further. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that all word reports need to go, but my role has also looked at how can we improve the way that we produce these reports to kind of reduce the burden of admin and formatting documents. So a, a, a challenge that I took to hack um, a couple of hacks ago was looking at how we can automatically produce these reports which focused on utilizing a power app um, and taking the information from that and putting it into a Word document automatically through Power Automate. So without knowing what was possible, I didn't know that I could actually do this and that this was something that we could do to kind of work smarter in that respect. So I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple of examples of what I've learned on the data analytics apprenticeship. Um, the first one focused on data collection. So moving from an Excel based collection to Power Apps. 
and this focused on the lessons learned that were captured on now my new project, the A428. Um, so using um, Power Apps, I produced this user-friendly platform, which mirrors exactly what we capture within the Excel template, but does it in a more sophisticated manner. And the benefits for this is increased control over how we collect the data and how people populate these fields, um, as well as giving us data security. It's a more user friendly experience, and we're hoping that this is going to drive up the engagement that we see um, from the project um, colleagues. So rather than capturing lessons learned at workshops at the end of project stages or at the end of certain milestones, can we do this on the fly so it's fresh in mind and that we also don't lose um, sight of lessons that we've learned because people are simply left by the time we hold these workshops. And eventually it will give us a deeper understanding of the data that we collect through analysing this. But um, at this point in time um, and the stage of the project in, we haven't got this. We are simply in the data collection stage at the moment. The next example I want to give is about data anal analysis itself. Um, and this is actually a challenge that I took to the most recent hackathon. And we was looking at how can we utilise customer correspondence data, which we already have in abundance, and use this to kind of predict our future performance and how quickly it takes our customer team to respond to our customers. And this was using a machine learning model. Now, the benefit for this um, would be the ability to meet our SLAs. Um, so that will give the customers a much better experience if we are being able to answer them in a, in a better manner. Um, it will also help with resource planning and also work like prioritize, prioritization. So the idea of this challenge was to, one, predict how long it would take to answer a certain piece of correspondence, depending on its certain attributes, and then flag this to the customer team to see which um, items would potentially miss our SLA so they can prioritise and focus on them um, in order to close, out, to close them out quickly. And then just to kind of wrap all of that up, um, again, my, my role as a as a thanks to the apprenticeship has moved from admin based tasks towards information management and these smarter ways of working. The role can kind of be described as a data translator. So whilst I'm nowhere near a uh, developer as such, I'm in a kind of unique position where I can now sit in between the project where I can understand the business requirements and on the other side um, in between the project and the developers themselves. Um, in order to be that kind of linchpin between the two and deliver these solutions to impro improve our project delivery. And then again, just to kind of reiterate, really, the, the apprenticeships provided me with a broad understanding of what is possible. Without this perspective, there isn't really a choice other than to accept these methods of working and these processes that have been used for a long, long time. And whilst they might have been efficient in the past, they might then not necessarily are so today. Um, and we can't really expect to improve uh, project delivery by moving by doing these same things in the way that we have always done them. Um, so there's definitely a lot of room for us to move. And this is what I'm kind of looking at now. So moving away from this admin heavy work into the data world, all thanks to the apprenticeship. And that is all from me. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or reach out to me on LinkedIn. OK, superb. Thank you, Kai. Um, I'd like to build on that. So it sounds like Kai's job has changed quite significantly as a consequence. And um, so I look back three or four years and there were loads of people designing motorways, right? Working out where the gantries need to go and all this other stuff. So Bride and Wood came along and said, so we can now automate the design of a motorway, right? So if you can sort of automate that, and that's been given away now, so that's an open source tool. Just imagine if you can design a motorway, you can then resource load a motorway and automatically work out the schedule. You can automatically work out your bills and materials. You can work out, you know, what the difference is between uh, building it in winter versus building it in summer, etc. There is so much you can do with it. It is absolutely huge. So I think Kai's at the start of a really exciting journey. It's going to be a transformational journey. And I do think the role of public officials is going to massively change as a consequence of project data analytics. So well done, Kai. So I think you're moving the bar in terms of the challenges that you brought to the hacker as well. You know, I think that's things you can pick up, start to do something with, and then bring it back to the hack again. We'll keep building on it and building on it and building it. And that's the nature of my talk in a bit. All right, so well done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next up is Nick. 
Um, and Nick's done some great stuff, right? So Nick works for Mark McDonald. Uh, for those people who don't know, it's a consultancy uh, working like infrastructure and construction business and things like that. Um, so it's a different view. So you've had a client, which is National Highways. You've had a construction company, which is CISC. Now you've got a consultancy company. And Nick, once again, I've had some great conversations with Nick and with Torben, who comes up next. These guys really get it, right? Smart individuals who's really sort of pushing the boundaries. Uh, so Nick, the floor is yours, sir. Go for it. Thank you so much. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say thank you. I'm really pleased to be a part of the community and uh, um, especially um, at the start of the journey, help me to realize the importance of this emergent role and also, you know, attending the hackathons, meeting new people and, uh, and uh, you know, the networking opportunities. So let me just share my screen and start the presentation. Um, let me just do that now. Let me know once you can see my screen. Hopefully now. Yeah, good. Perfect. Thank you. So a bit of it, a little bit about myself. So I have a civil engineering degree, but I worked as a construction project manager for the last three years. So I have a MAPM and PMQ. And for the last one and a half years, I my role greatly shifted towards uh, digital project management. Um, it's when I first entered one of the projects and I had um, um, a responsibility to um, implement Power BI. Um, this is when I kind of started to understand the the art of the possible, but I still didn't have that skills and experience. And I'm also supporting uh, project management technical excellence in Europe at Mount McDonald uh, for the last two years, which helps me um, connect and disseminate the knowledge that I get from the apprenticeship. Um, I just wanted to focus um, on one slide to explain why PDA is important to me as a project manager, because I witnessed um, as, as a construction project manager, a lot of tedious and manual, manual processes. So for example, we all know um, how we need to find the right spreadsheet at the start of the projects and how, for example, we need to identify all the risks. And uh, in order to do that, we need to find you know the best spreadsheet or the right people. Um, there's also a lot of um, unstructured and, and poor quality data. Sometimes the data is uh, scattered around different environments, such as, for example, SharePoint or, or a P6 um, software. Um, there's also um, lack of insights from the data, which uh, actually I understood based on apprenticeship that we spend a lot of time on reporting information, but we don't actually take actionable insights from it. So. Um, that comes to my my vision of project management, uh, which shaped throughout the apprenticeship. Um, and I think that um, we, in the future we'll have um, AI helping us to complete some simple manual tasks. Um, for example, uh, we'll be able to automate some of the reporting um, at the end of the month. Um, we'll be able to um, um, automate some of the um, 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 prediction of resource and schedule, which uh, you previously mentioned with the example of Highways England. Uh, but more importantly, it will help us to make uh, complex analysis more accessible. So we'll have all the dashboards, all the information coming through um, uh, different different sources. And uh, we need to be able to, as project managers, I think we are the conduit between the project team. So we work with different disciplines, including the, the engineers, uh, the architects, the contracts, uh, um, so all the information passes through us, and I think it's important that we develop that knowledge and understanding so we can have uh, uh, more contribution by adding value to the project through advisory services. And of course, for that, we'll need to have more technical knowledge to understand that. Um, in terms of the outcomes of the apprenticeship, I think one of the most important um, points is that um, I managed to understand the bigger picture and, and challenge that we are now facing. and. Uh, and gain um, the the relevant materials and, and knowledge based on the on on the slides and the conversations of people that I had to build a business case for to enable more McDonald's to invest more in in the digital and uh, of course uh, this was uh, possible because I improved my IT literacy in uh, in the Power Platform um, SQL and Python and as a result um, now um, my role has shifted from. Uh, project management. So I moved into a different uh, division within within the business and uh, started helping shape the digital strategy for our unit. So we are now, thanks to the apprenticeship, I was um, able to shape the team structure to develop um, low code solutions, which serve the whole unit. Um, also developed the roles and responsibilities uh, and job descriptions, which were not there before and aligned them across the business. Um, and uh, we managed to found an advisory data analytics team, which is now 
uh, has eight members and, and counting. So we will we'll be recruiting more and more people and uh, more importantly, helping to understand the importance of having new roles, uh, not even the data analyst roles, but also the roles of business analysts, the people, the translator roles who, who work with business professionals and connect them to, to the technical professionals in the IT um, in order to develop solutions which focus on the business outcomes. And that causes strong ripple effects across the unit to boost the investment. So now we've got um, a unit digital lead appointed. We've got um, also a number of initiatives that I'm working. For example, um, uh, thanks, thanks to that apprenticeship, we managed to take off the ground one of the projects which is um, aiming to digitalize the project management, the way we deliver projects by collecting, uh, managing, analyzing and reporting information consistently across the risk, change, schedule and cost. And we are really excited that this project is going to launch, launch in August. Thank you. I'm sure you have uh, a lot of questions, but I'm really grateful to be um, to be a part of this apprenticeship, to get in knowledge and to be a part of this brilliant community. Cool. Well done, Nick. So it sounds like your job's moved quite a lot in the last sort of six months, 12 months or so. Yes, it has. And uh, I'm really pleased that the business has also given me the responsibility to help shape the future. So I can I can then use the knowledge that I get um, from the apprenticeship and disseminate it across the business, which is um, really great. And it does make a real tangible uh, impact on what we do. Um, and, you know, it helps us um, connect with other parts of the business, have more meaningful discussions. You know, recently at Mo McDonald's, not thanks to me, of course, but the timing is right. We've got a data science lead appointed as well, and we all have um, discussions to, to shape that digital strategy to get the frameworks and practices in place in order to foster innovation, have that sustainable um, a digital digital change, digital transformation throughout uh, throughout the unit and, and beyond. Cool. So a big thing about the community as well, like this market didn't exist three years ago. It just wasn't there. So if you went to a client and you knocked on their door and said, would you like to buy some project data analytics? They'd look at you like you're a Martian, right? So because of the power of the community, we've got 9,000 of us with a voice, we've got the hacks, we've got everything else going on, we're working with the API and all these other things. Working together, we're creating a new market which creates new jobs, that creates new insights, that creates economic growth. It's phenomenal. And it's down to you guys, you know? Cool stuff. Right. If I could welcome Torben to the stage, and then I'll open it up to Q&A, and then I'll do my presentation. So, Torben, welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, I must apologize about the terrible lighting. Uh, it kind of cuts across my face. Um, but that's just the nature of working at home in this environment. Um, if I could just share my screen, I've got a, a few slides prepared as well. Um, hang on, is that gone on? Right, there we go. Yeah, we see it now. Fantastic. OK, so first of all, I thought I'd start with the same as everyone else has, a bit of personal background. Um, I'm someone who's interested in just about everything, really naturally curious. And when I say everything, I do mean everything. I can end up in Wikipedia uh, click holes for hours and hours if, if a topic takes, takes my sort of appreciation. During my time at school, I realized that I was particularly in enjoying two subjects, maths and philosophy, which are both very abstract. Um, and so being abstract, I ended up quite a, a loose end after I finished my studies and was ready to step out into the wor world of work uh, with lots of skills to apply, but no direction, which led me to the first step in my journey, working out where I wanted to actually go. So I was throwing out CVs anywhere and everywhere just to see what would stick. And after a lot of sub CV submissions and rejected interviews ended up working in an entry level reporting role for a digital marketing agency. Um, this was great and a fantastic introduction, but after finding I was good at working in Excel and handling data, uh, generating reports, I moved into a role which involved more data analysis. As you can imagine, in the world of web, data was always at the core of almost every bit of work we've done. Uh, it was sort of, I guess, pushing forward the industry that we have around us now, and we're trying to transform the construction industry, which I work in, to sort of adapt these techniques. Um, and this role was an excellent start to my journey. It kicked the whole thing off. 
But the analysis I found was always retrospective. I had questions coming out like, find why this web page wasn't so successful, why the products weren't being browsed, etc. And at, at that point, I, I sort of felt this was the end of my journey, except for honing and developing the skills I already had under my belt. I, I wanted to work up the ranks using that sort of basic sort of, uh, I guess, platform to, to, to stand on. Um, and then a little bit after, I, I took some time out so that I could travel and explore the world, but I didn't have any any work lined up for when I got back. And somehow I stumbled into my current company, uh, Mont McDonald, which Nick has sort of briefly introduced you to in the role that I have now. Uh, one of the challenges was that this role was much more delivery focused. Instead of looking forward, uh, instead of looking backwards, rather, I was looking forward how to complete the delivery. This was a bit of a challenge for me to adjust to. And, you know, I, I got there in the end, but it wasn't easy. Being used to analyzing the results of already completed work, suddenly having to use this data to understand the state of work and the progress it had taken, how far it was away from completion was very much a new thing to me. Uh, it brought the importance of good project management and the importance of that communication between project management and uh, the data analytics to ensure successful delivery into my eye view. And with it, a whole host of new skills to develop that I'd never needed before suddenly became necessary. Second challenge was, as I'd mentioned, I, I was used to very strict and uh, defined data. Whereas I found in the construction industry, as opposed to the web industry, uh, all the data had been gathering in cobwebs in the corners of dusty old, uh, like abandoned temporary folders, simply set up for the purpose of a project. And there was very little consistency between projects. So this is where project data analytics and projecting success comes in. I got told about the apprenticeship. At first, I thought it would be an excellent way just to bolster my understanding of delivering projects and how to combine that with my already slightly developed data analysis skills. And it's done just that. I, um, I, I definitely feel that it's combined those two elements of, of my skill set. But what I didn't expect was it would give me uh, an experience and an overview of something I've been reading about online and interested in articles but never thought would be applicable in my role professionally. And that's predictive analytics in the form of machine learning. What I'd learned in school was essentially simple trends, trying to find a line of best fit to assess, you know, a, a bit of probability. I never thought I'd be exposed to this more high tech, modern approach to analyzing data in my work. So, from this, what I've learned during the course has transformed the way I work for several reasons. First of all, most simply, I've managed to use the skills that I've gained to automate several time consuming manu manual processes using new techniques and, and, and coding, which I'd learned, have an eye to develop predictive tools to help evade delays or additional costs in the delivery of projects from the offset rather than looking retrospectively and saying, oh, this is why it went wrong. So now what I called challenges, I see more as puzzles to be enjoyed and solved instead of hurdles to overcome. The tools to change this industry for the better are there. They just need to be put in place. And that's where we come in. And by we, I mean you, me, and other members of this community. Thank you very much. Absolutely Any super. questions? Happy to answer. Sorry, Mike. Really, Martin. really good that Torben. And what I like about Torben as well is he's a man with no fear. Right? <laughs> so, I think it was his first or his second hack. He jumped into GPT-3 and I went to see him and said, Torben, this is your first hack, right? Is this what you should be doing? And he said, yeah, let me at it. And mm. he really got into it. He did a stonking job. I, I do like, like a challenge. Yeah. And I think some of this is just immersing yourself in it, being curious, inquiring mind, and mm. just sort of want to break some things. 
Yeah. And so what I really liked about it is the word puzzle, right? So I've never heard that word being used in this context before. Maybe mm. we drop the word sort of challenge and do start to use the word puzzle because it is something to be solved. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, good. Yeah, it, it feels like a, a Sudoku with more levels to yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, cool. So if I could welcome all four of you back to this stage again, and then um, we open the floor, and if anybody's got any uh, questions for the guys, then please jump in. So any members of the community just want to have a conversation with these guys? And Tobin, if you could stop sharing your screen as well, that'd be cool. Thank you. Um, so anybody? So if I could start it off and, and, and just say to all of you, now where do you think the future is going to be in, in say, five years' time from now? So what does it mean for your career? Uh, what does the future of project delivery look like? Um, and what's your career pathway to prepare for that as well? Any thoughts on that? For, for me, um, it's striking that as an analyst, I spend a lot of time what I would call shoveling data. Um, and hopefully this isn't seen as a bad thing to say, but I don't actually care about data. I care about analytics. So where I see us getting to hopefully is the point that the data kind of does itself and is left with the IT department kind of tweaking things so that we can kind of capture it better and better. And then it opens up the time for analysts to be kind of at the cutting edge, making things better and, and bringing colleagues along for the journey too. Um, that would be the main thing that I would hope to see. Cool. And Tobin? Sorry, I was on mute there for a second. Um, I pretty much reiterate what Alex has said. It's so frustrating having to shunt data from one place to another and then re-manipulate it into a format that is something which we can actually use for analysis. Um, but beyond that, what I'm... I, particularly keen on is changing it from a retrospective look back at where things went wrong to a future look at where we can change things so that things don't go wrong at all, evading the problem entirely. Love it. Love it. Brilliant. And, and Nick? I think that, uh, well, based on my experience at McDonald, I, I think that um, it's it's really important to be able to standardize um, the way we we deliver our ways of working. I think that's one of the major challenges, and that's why you have all that desperate data um, across um, across the different um, sources. So, for example, um, you have uh, different um, different risk registers um, across different uh, projects and stuff. So, I think that's. Uh, our major challenge will be to build a business case so that we can um, standardize the way we collect information. So maybe, uh, perhaps, you know, for example, the way we collect the the, the risk data. Once again, uh, if we agree on the way to collect information, if we clearly outline the business benefits of doing so, because there are some um, uh, sacrifices that we'll need to make in terms of the flexibility. I think the, the, the potential benefits of that are quite enormous. I'm not sure that uh, we're actually going to do much of data science because I think um, in order to the data science, you really need to have that the volume velocity of, of data. Um, and it's probably going to be more of a, I can see that as a kind of centralized um, department which serves the whole business. But we need to be able to prepare the high quality of data, have a clear scope for data analysis so we come with that scope um, to the data science team so they can then uh, feed us feed us with the with the right information and uh, also set up production machine learning models which learn and adapt um, as we gain more and more information across our projects that's cool and i think you know in terms of this data as well so through the construction data trust we start to pull this data look at productivity problems we we'll look at community challenges where we all pull that data bring you guys into the community you'll solve these puzzles i will accelerate right at a phenomenal pace how cool is that eh? so okay and then i'll pass over to breeder so for me i think over the next five years i think the most important thing is the majority of project professionals having some form of understanding of data and data analytics a lot of what i'm kind of doing at the moment 
a lot of people don't trust it because it's it's a complete unknown to them. So I think in order to get to that step, um, th that level of understanding is required across the majority of the board, I would say. Um, and then just to echo Torben, I think a lot of our analytics at the moment are kind of lagging and looking backwards of kind of what went wrong or what's happened in the past. But the future is definitely using this information to, to predict how we're going to perform in the future in order to improve delivery. Cool. Excellent stuff. Uh, Breda. Brilliant. Welcome. So so folks, you're doing a fabulous job on this path, so keep going. Um, I have a really curious question around um, what each of you faced as the biggest obstacle getting started in this, either professionally or organisationally, and what you would advise people who are yet to get on this path to do. Fun to having a go at that. Kai, go for it. I'll have a go. Um, so for me, it was simply just the learning curve. Um, as I mentioned in my in my presentation just now, I studied psychology as my degree. Um, so I didn't have any kind of background in data or data analytics. So that learning curve was pretty steep and doing it alongside your job as well adds quite a bit of pressure. Um, so my advice would be to kind of go with it, answer as many questions as you can. There's no such thing as a silly question, even if you feel like you're among, amongst your peers on a Teams call. Um, if everyone watching you, there's definitely no such thing as a silly question. Um, and just engage with it, get involved with the hackathons, because that's where I picked up most of my skills. Um, it's where you really get to put everything you've learned into practice, which I think learning by doing is always is always the best. So, yeah. Okay, okay cool. And in terms of your psychology background, right? It's not just, you know, you've done that degree and you've moved on to something different. I think now you can build on it. So mm -hmm. what we're not doing in project delivery is looking at team performance and the psychology of team performance, Definitely. the way they all behave and the way leadership influences team performance, all that sort of stuff. There's mm -hmm. so much mileage in that. And with your training and your experience, you can get immersed in that and start to move the dial on it, which is cool. I agree. agree. Tobin? Oh, sorry, I was just going to echo that. Um... It doesn't matter if you have a background specifically in data analytics or project delivery. I came from mostly a philosophy background and it's literally a case of getting stuck in and, and using your natural curiosity to involve yourself in, in, in the structure around you. Truly agile careers here. Yeah, and Nick? I think it's also about um, communicating communicating the real benefits of it. Yeah, you know, the answering the question, why do we want to do that, and helping build a business case. Because what we found is, apologies, so I have a bad internet connection. Um, because it's it's really it's really important that we have the right talents and skills as well. And sometimes it's a bit challenging because even though we might have a great uh, project in mind, it might be difficult to execute, especially at the, in the beginning when you don't have the right skills and and, and not um, right mentorship because because of the way your um, essentially um, unit uh, disciplines focus on. So it's uh, once you build that business case, you can then help the business understand and bring the talent in and then you can start working on these projects. I think that's what I found really helpful. Cracking. Good stuff. Thank you. And does anybody else want to come in? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I'd, I'd say that professionally the biggest challenge was believing that the data had to be perfect and when it wasn't just kind of giving up. Um, I think that I've kind of realized that you have to get stuck in with what you what you have and what I've said to the guys I'm working with now is that what we do now to improve our data quality processes will give us good data in due course that we need to be we need to be predicting what we want to be looking at in three years time and start gathering data around it right away there's like no time like the present and i'd say personally in terms of the apprenticeship the challenge was believing that i needed to be kind of a, a coding genius which i absolutely am not um i think that what i've realized more and more is that the role that i play in the team is to understand where we need a coding genius and how to get that coding genius to speak to a grizzly contracts manager. Um, that's kind of the, the position that I've now got within the company. Oh, oh, that's excellent insight, Alex. Thank you for that. And you're right, data doesn't have to be perfect to know where you want to go with it. Yeah. Thank so you. I think we've learned that. So we've learned from that through the hacks as well, is you've got to play the cards you dealt. So in the early hacks, people used to say to us, all oh, the data is rubbish, there's nothing I can do with it. I said, well, you've got two days here, what are you going to do? 
Because you're going to lose if you say oh, it's too hard. <laughs> so well, the data is always going to be rubbish. You need to make it not rubbish. That's part of a pre-processing, which in my previous role, I was lucky enough to have that done and handed to me this, this excellent quality data. Whereas in, in this environment, as opposed to web, there's definitely a lot more pre-processing which needs to be done as part of the data analytics sort of pipeline. Yeah, 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 cool. Uh, Tristan, welcome. Uh, good to have you back. So, so Tristan came to the hack. Um, and over to you, Tristan. Thanks for joining yeah, us. E evening, everyone. So just to build on Greta's question there, a bit around the challenges of getting your organisation up to speed and adopting all this. So, I mean, just today I had queries coming in from people in the organisation about can we make all the work we're doing visible and get it in dashboards and so that people can search it and, and look at this stuff. So it's the simple stuff that like you guys have been doing. But the challenge we've got is a limited resource across the organisation and people who have busy day jobs already. So how would you say you guys tackled the challenge of um, building on these skills where you've got busy day jobs and making the space for it? And also, what challenges did you face in your organisations to actually get this culture change to look more at the data uh, and use these new tools rather than doing everything in Excel like we currently are? So. I'd, I'd say just to, to jump in on that, I, I think where we are at the moment is that we've, we're still a little bit at the death by dashboard stage of building lots and lots, but we've kind of realised that actually, yeah, when it comes to members of the board, they're not going to sit in your Power BI dashboard and set the filters right. They just want to know what the, the important thing from the dashboard is. And actually, like, they just want five bullet points of this is what's changed and this is what's important. And if you want to see a dashboard, here it is kind of thing. And actually, it's one of the things that we, we talked about at a future hack of saying the final output shouldn't be a dashboard. It should be an email with five bullet points on telling you what you need to do next that where we are with it and that's the challenge that I've got is the board is saying like this just looks like a different colored report yeah and I think there's more people finding that so I've been talking to Petrifac as well and various other companies and they're getting passed through this process so people start off and they get into dashboards and they have more and more dashboards a dashboard overload a dashboard rationalization dashboard governance and then they start to move into this insight bit you now which is your four or five insights and if you can pull that out and start to get some narrative around it then that's where we're going to end up so i think it's a cycle it's a life cycle of starting to map what a life cycle is and nick and torben who wants to go first torben you want to go um I, I i suspect we might have been making the same point but i'll go ahead um what one of the big challenges is nick and i both work in a in a really bear large company uh, and there's often quite sort of sunken ways of working where you've got to try and, I guess, motivate cultural change uh, and a different outlook in the hierarchy that you're sat within. You've, you've got to try and inspire uh, the people who manage you, if, especially if you're sort of a beginning of your career, to accept that this is something worth doing and something which will change and develop the industry. But that was that was my point. Uh, Nick, would you like to share yours? I think you're absolutely right. And um, it's it's also important that you can, you know, for example, we asked the same questions, you know, can you, can you develop dashboards for, for here and for here and for here? And, you know, um, mm. it would be one of the main challenges that we found is that the data is not as accessible and is not as structured. So what we're trying to do, if, if we, for example, have that simple request, we, we uh, if you have the right resources, we serve it right away um, by using, you know, um, uh, quick, quick fix, quick win solutions like Excel. But what we're trying to push for is to have that consistent, um, have that then consistently across the group, you know, check whether there is actually a need uh, you know, across the business for for a similar requirement, and usually there is. And if if there is a similar requirement, you can always get the right budget in place, and you have the right budget, you can build the pipeline of work, and then you can you can uh, support the business case for bringing in more people, or for example, um, attracting someone from from within the business to help deliver that. Cool, good stuff. 
Is that okay, Tristan? Yeah, excellent. Thanks very much, guys. And I think, yeah, the, it's the cultural piece. And like Alex said, going through that, once you start showing people dashboards, everyone wants them, but it's dialing that back and actually making them meaningful to deliver the business change that we need. So, yeah. yeah, thanks very much for your answers. Yeah, cool. No problem. Happy to discuss this more if you want to offline out of this meeting. I know we're on a time limit, so. Cool, good. Um, in terms of those dashboards as well, so personally, I think we'll move away from them in due course. I think we'll get to a point where we're machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. So you understand where the tolerance is. And once you're out of tolerance, that's when it it triggers some sort of action. And that tolerance is going to be dynamic based upon where you are in the life cycle. So once we get to that point, we're talking really clever stuff. You know, and that's when you not earn your money. Uh, Jonathan, you popped up and then over to Ken, and then I'll do my last presentation. So Jonathan, go for it. Yeah, hi everyone. And, and thanks everyone for sharing your stories. It's, it's brilliant. Um, you're all obviously really passionate about this. You've dived straight in. You've mentioned curiosity and just getting involved. So I'm, I'm going to test you a little bit, but run forward a couple of years and the almost the commercial models of, of businesses aren't around. We've got data that we can sell to you, but actually it's all open sourced. It's all pooled. I gave you know, you're on this community for that very reason that you believe in that. So I want to hear from you in terms of what is the next commercial advantage that you can gain from actually open source data that everyone has access to? Where's the next level of insights going to come from that's really going to drive the performance forward? What are your thoughts on that? That's a brilliant question. Really like that. So the consultancy guys, I think first. So Nick and Tobin. So Nick. Are you on mute, Nick? Thank you. Just realized. So I I think um is is definitely uh, it'll be definitely beneficial for the industry to be more open source and more transparent so we can collect more more data to build more accurate models and essentially what this will enable us to do as project managers i think is to be focusing more on advisory services um, and rather than reporting on what happened we'll be able to look at the information and then provide actionable insights to intervene and improve the project outcomes yeah so superpowers Yep. So the company with the most superpowers is going to win it. And so basically, you know, if you can see round corners, you can predict the future, all this other stuff, and do it better than anybody else, probably going to win the game. Uh, and Kai? Yeah, it's just to kind of echo that, really. So we can have all this data that's pooled and accessible to everybody, but it's about what you do with it. So that there's so many different directions that you can take it in. And yeah, I think it's just going to be the, the, the best company wins kind of kind of situation depending on how you use that data to your advantage. Yeah. So it's about sort of innovation potential. So your ability to innovate and be clever with that data instead of uh, because you happen to sat on a massive data set because you've been working with a load of clients for the past 10 years or something. And a little startup just can't access that data. And that doesn't feel fair to me. So we're living in the playing field and the cleverest people are going to win, which is cool. All right, that's good. Alex. I'd, I'd like to see kind of it lead to more openness across a project delivery team. So you kind of all win together or lose together rather than one person being best placed to win and everybody else kind of losing out. That I'd like to think would be the next step that we have a bit more in the way of kind of open book projects. Yeah. So open book projects, I think, is is going to blow a lot of people's minds. Right. So next generation procurement, I think, you know, we just don't know what that looks like. And there'll be people from this community who's going to be shaping that. That's a brand new set of jobs, right? Brand new set of jobs. People's not even invented them yet. They don't even know what they look like, right? I'm, I'm already so, imagining the, the emails I'm going to get from our QSs tomorrow when, <laughs> when they hear that I've just gone on record saying that. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that you took that over because I'm sure I would have got on a much more political rant and wasted all of our time. <laughs> Yeah, cool. And last one from Ken. Welcome, Ken. You there? Yep. So, especially for, I think it was Torben and Kai with the philosophy and psychology background, when the data gives results of your, you know, your, your data analysis gives results that the old gray haired people disagree with, how do you? help them overcome their biases? Do you point out what the 
call out their biases for what they are? Or uh, do you find a more gentle way of explaining how they're going wrong? Nick, go for it. I, I, I Carl, it's, if, it's a if very you don't mind, I'll step in on this one. Um, yep. yep, sorry, go on, Sobin. If Nick goes through oh, first, which no, Sobin. No, Nick, you take the floor, you take the floor. Oh, thank you. Um, I think it's a, it's an excellent question. And uh, the, the, the one of the problems is that uh, the data itself might be biased. So that that that's for, for one. So I think in order to answer that question, you really need to think about where your data is coming from um, and what, what forms the basis for that data. And once you've explained that, I think that will help um, support the decision making. Yeah, uh, cool. And Kai? I think it's a really, really interesting question because uh, the, the way that psychology makes up the human, it's everyone's going to look at it from a different perspective. They're all going to look at the same set of information and take a different extract from that. And I think that's the kind of key to having that realisation. Um, and you've also got to avoid the situation where you are specifically, you have the answer in mind and then you look at the data and what it's showing you and kind of use having that pre-bias, um, which I think is a very uh, dangerous kind of road to go down, making the data fit your own thoughts. Um, so I think having that understanding is got, is the first step to breaking that down, really. Cool, good. And last but not least, Torben. Yeah, so very much the same as what Kai was saying, it's important to recognize the uh, biases which may be inherent in the data. Um, but to go back specifically to what you were asking, it's a more gentle approach is, is definitely necessary because, frankly, people don't like hearing that the way of working they've been using for years and years is not effective. So it's, it's, it's more a case of slow cultural transformation and and um i guess gently uh approaching uh a new way of thinking and 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 convincing people which is is where my philosophy has is coming useful and in, in developing argumentation yeah cool so folks i'll have to call it in terms of the q a because i've got a little presentation so i did plan sort of 12 minutes for this i've got seven so i'll canter through it um, and I think in terms of this stuff, what I'm finding is it's not about um, a slow transformational change. I think for some organisations now, it's either get on the bus or get left behind. And there's some people who's bobbing in the weight now, right? They're not going to keep up with this rate of change. And their organisations are not going to keep up with the rate of change. And they'll fall behind and other people will outperform them. So I've got a presentation for you now, uh, which is something I've been working on through the task force. It's not quite finished. So if you've got any comments on it, then please fire them through to me. Let me see if I can present this through Teams. Um, and I'll do it rapid fire. So just bear with me while it loads up. It's loading my presentation. Can you see that okay? Yeah, all good. Right. So what we're trying to do through the task force, so we've got to work collaboratively across all sectors to deliver a 10 times improvement in project delivery performance. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to work these solutions up, these insights, this transformation of data for the benefit of everybody. So we've been plodding along with this and we want to now accelerate it. And I want to accelerate it massively by two orders of magnitude. So if we just think, right, what would a next generation PMO look like? So what would next generation of risk management look like? What can we do to release capacity? So all these people who's doing stuff that we don't want to do anymore, so we can move them up the value chain. What can we do to create tools to pull data into water, back to the calculate carbon cost and much, much more, and sort of optimize all of that. Just imagine that we could do that collaboratively rather than individually, which is where we are at the moment. So we can use the hackathon to start to do some of this stuff. But the first problem is we've not got, disagreement in terms of the problems that we're trying to solve. It's not the problems of today in terms of looking backwards and saying, you know, what's the best way of fixing risk management? What's the best way of fixing benefits management? It's saying, what can we do to reinvent some of this so it's a much more streamlined and effective 
and sort of insightful process. And I think we can all do that by pulling together. So just imagine a situation where we can systematically break down or decompose these problems. Once they've been decomposed like productivity, it's a puzzle, right? It's back to Torben's point, it's a puzzle. Once the puzzle is solved, then that... Uh, so that's a logical decomposition of that problem statement. So we can open source that. It means the puzzle has been solved and you can populate the data into that puzzle and it works the answer out. So that becomes a live community asset. So what we can then do is to look at in terms of data alignment up against that puzzle and work out the solutions that we want to go for. So we can then map the alignment between the data and the solutions, the solutions and those problem statements. And what we can then do by querying that data, so imagine this is a piece of paper and you can query into the page. So there'll be Mott McDonald's data, SIS data, National Highways data, Jacob's data, everybody else's data. You can query through it. You can work out the cost of fixing that data, the cost of generating the solutions, and compare that against the benefit of solving the use case or the user stories. And that's when it starts to get really, really amazing. So we need to be really co so courageous and we need to be really bold. We need to think the impossible. And I think, you know, back to this thing about the bride and wood automation of a motorway, how far could we get to a fully automated project? And what does that mean for all of us, right? And I don't think this is a matter of saving jobs and saving money. It's about moving people up the value chain, and delivering projects with greater confidence and for less money, which means we can deliver more projects so we can transform society and create economic value. So just imagine for each of these themes like productivity and risk management and benefits management and lessons learned, we start to imagine a vision for 2025 and 2030, and we create a hard target and a stretch target. So we sit down as a community and start to think this through and spin off some little working groups and we start to do it. And then we set people free to create these theme level roadmaps. And they can prioritize a set of puzzles or challenges that we all solve together at pace through the hackathons. Um, and you look across government, right? There's loads of money going into this, which is all in little silos. If you can pull that together, and I'm not saying you put it all in one bank account, I'm just saying different people pick off different bits of the roadmap. So you've just got one roadmap across government that different people fund different parts. And at the moment, everybody's funding random bits because nobody's got the roadmap. So the communities can all own that roadmap. But the problem is most organizations are too busy cutting down trees to stop and sharpen the saw. And as a community, we've got a load of chainsaws over here where we can really, really speed this process up. So a busy slide now. So what we I can think about, do we need this 100 million pound business case where the infrastructure projects authority sits on this and they go and farm projects out and different people do different things? That's going to take an age because it all needs to be governed. You need to write a business case, find the money, et cetera. So we've got all these separate resources across the community at the moment. We pull it together and we start to transform the rate of change. We've got hundreds of people who's attending project hacks so 240 people last time there's going to be much more for the next one we can create solutions in a couple of days we've got hundreds of members of the project data academy who's coming together they've got to create projects as part of their uh, project portfolio for their endpoint assessment they are change agents they are changing the world and organizations are spending millions of pounds tackling common problems fixing data we could all be collaborating on that all right so what I want us to do is to accelerate through this commodity end of the spectrum where we start to configure these solutions and start to move into the clever stuff, which is in the four to sort of eight space and work with companies like Nplan and Nodes on Links to do the really, really clever stuff and start to move at pace. These are the, some of the things we could be working on. So there's some themes in there, We're working those at the moment. So as we work through this process, we start to open source the solutions and the code we provide access to the data through the data trust, et cetera. But don't these solutions need to be more intelligent? So what do we need to do to manage this? 
And it's all about the data. So if you've got the volume of data, you can drive the high-end analytics because you've got the data to drive machine learning. We can benefit from that through a data trust. And these data trusts, it already exists. It's a not-for-profit entity where the member defines the, these rules. It's there now, it's operational. So is this a credible proposition? And so we've got the senior membership from the task force, from a load of different organizations. We've got 13 hackathons we've delivered so far with the Major Projects Association, the APM, we've got 9,000 sort of people through the community. And we're also doing some good as well. Through all your tickets and through your cash, we've now raised seven and a half thousand pounds for cancer research. And we can still keep driving that up. So everybody benefits. So basically we've all got a shared vision and we're sharing it with others. We all know where we're heading. Team are all gaining valuable experience from being involved in this. You're all bouncing ideas off each other. You all gain access to these solutions. You drive this commonality. So if you give these solutions away, instead of specifying lots of standards that sit in a drawer and nobody reads them, we can build them into some of these tools so the, it's data standardization at the point of origin. So the data improves, insights improve, and we can accelerate this and start to reduce the trial and error risk because we're doing it at pace. Everybody starts to get tremendous gearing from these investments, our collective investments. So what's the ask? So there's some points there about deciding sort of where your organization wants to be involved. We've got to get a lead, someone's going to orchestrate this, and I think Jonathan might be raising his hand to get involved in this and to lead some of this thinking. Uh, develop your strategy and plan. Um, it's not waterfall, we can't do this through a monster plan that's going to last the next sort of 10 years. We need to be sprinting through this at pace. You've got to work your skills up so you can do it, and by pulling together, the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. We need to all engage and shape these problem statements work up the visions, work up the roadmaps, or we can pilot productionize and start to really get this thing flying. And for government, it's building a coalition inside of government. So we now got that, there's a sort of cross government working group and if other people want to get involved in that, I'm fantastic. Um, it's going to be agile, it's going to be fast fail and it's going to be iterating at pace. So that can then sort of join in with this uh, community initiative and bring a lot of resource to bear so we can start to move it. And I say to people in government, do not underestimate your influence. So if you're driving this, you can have a monster impact on your supply chain. And if you start to build this into some of your bids, you will change the market massively. So it's about collaboration. We can go a hundred times quicker together than alone. And with this sort of approach, we can really accelerate out of it. So the short term, so we're trying to get the task force re-energized. We're trying to get the next hackathon to really think about what the solution pipeline. So rather than just think about point solutions at the moment, they're a bit random. So let's start to align them to a roadmap. We can commit effort and we can start to shape these requirements. In the longer term, we can then sprint through this, productionize it, get end-to-end -end solutions, and capture the benefits and demonstrate the success, celebrate that success, build momentum, and really make an impact on the world. So all working together, we can change the dial. So let's make it happen. So if you've got any comments on it, uh, please find them through to me through LinkedIn or through email. Um, and let's sort of work together and we'll change the world, right? And you're all part of it, all of you. Right? It's not about me, it's not about projecting success, it's about the community, the task force, all putting together to move the dial. It's a bit of transformational thinking. If you'd like to be involved in this, if you want to shape that paper as well, so it's a task force paper that's going to be coming out. So I've floated it tonight to try and solicit some incoming fire. So if you've got any comments, then please fire it through to me. Um, or a member of the task force and we'll pull all of that and we'll try and get something going. Uh, so thank you much to everybody tonight. I really enjoyed tonight. It's great to see the impact we're making on people's lives. We're moving the dial. This is starting to influence projects now. We're right at the tip of a humongous iceberg, right? We can really change the world. And it's you guys who's all worked together is making it happen. So thank you all. I shall bow to you.
And thanks a lot to the guys who's given up their time tonight. Really appreciate it. Have a great evening. Cheers, all.